So some of us want to build our own spacecraft, and this is not normal. <laughs> Let me try to explain. This is a spacecraft you've seen before. Some of you recognize this. It's the Mars Science Lab, the Curiosity rover. It landed on Mars in August of 2012. It's a great achievement by NASA and, and for the nation and for science. Hundreds, maybe thousands of engineers and technicians worked for years to make this possible. And you're thinking, this is not the kind of spacecraft I'm ever going to build myself. And, you, and you're probably right, but hold that thought. Here's another picture of that same Curiosity rover. Uh, you can see this little target here. It's called a calibration target. It's for the cameras. Um, there was a point at which the engineers decided in order to calibrate the cameras, they'd put a convenient picture there. They thought they'd use the JPL logo. That's the Jet Propulsion Lab logo. And then NASA comes back and says, well, you know, it's a NASA project. It's not just a JPL project. Let's, let's use the NASA logo. They went back and forth, and finally the compromise was they'll put a little pixelated version of the rover itself, which is what that is. So, all well and good. But the engineers couldn't let that go. Instead, what they did is they redesigned the treads on the rover, the wheels, so that there are holes in there that spell out in Morse code JPL <laughs> as the wheels go over the surface of Mars. So now, rather than NASA seeing just one JPL, uh, there are thousands of JPLs all over Mars. Now, what's the impulse here? I mean, it's not just a prank. It's, it's much deeper than that, and it's that engineers want to create, we want to build, we want to invent, and we're proud of what we make. There's a personal connection to those things. That personal connection, that passion, in my view, is not exclusive to engineers. It's really part of all of us. It's a fundamentally human passion to want to create. And that's what drove Jordi puig -Suari and Bob Twiggs back in the late 90s to invent this thing. It's called a CubeSat. Uh, yes, it's cube-shaped. It's a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube. Uh, it weighs about a kilogram for a liter of spacecraft. And, and those of you who are put off right now by the metric system and are not following what I'm saying, um, I'm not speaking Dothraki here, OK? I mean, it, these are measurements people use. Um, my 13-year-old is cool with this, so I think you can come to the 21st century with me. Stick with me here. It's, it turns out, though, that it's surprisingly easy to build these things. College students, even high school students, have built CubeSats. What you do is you follow the specification. It's online, completely open source. You put it into one of these spring-loaded containers. That's one of the Cornell students right now doing that. Uh, you press it down. It goes launching up with a larger spacecraft that pays the bills, to be honest, is how that works. Uh, and then it pops out like a jack-in-the-box in space. They are, as I said, so straightforward that uh, students of many ages can make these work. Uh, the CubeSat idea has democratized access to space in a very important way. Among other things, I mean, there's educational benefits for sure, and to some extent this personalization principle is at work, but also this is a video showing many CubeSats launched one after another for a company called Planet Labs. Planet Labs is a startup in San Francisco. It is doing Earth imaging using these little tiny telescopes. But this is game changing. Their business model is a complete rethink of what it is to do Earth imaging. It's an interesting opportunity that CubeSats have brought forward for us. It's an opportunity, once again, to personalize space and to start something with relatively meager means, a small company, a garage company, that yet has the opportunity, the aspiration to go to space that can be realized. Here's another CubeSat project. This one's run by a Cornell student, Zach Manchester. Uh, he virtually single-handedly started this Kickstarter campaign. Kickstarter is a crowdfunding platform. And in fact, KickSat, his spacecraft, is the first crowdfunded satellite. He asked for $30,000 from the public, and they gave him $80,000. He did really well, so well that he was able to launch KickSat 1 in 2014. And you're wondering, where is the spacecraft? Where is the CubeSat? This is actually a spacecraft, and it's the payload for a CubeSat. So, you know, we get these big spacecraft that sometimes carry little CubeSats to orbit. This is what the CubeSats carry to orbit. It's called a ChipSat. 
the backers, the funders for this Kickstarter campaign, uh, each could get their own spacecraft and personalize access to space. Zach called it kickstarting the personal space age. Since 2011, when he started that campaign, chipsats have come a really long way. Hunter Adams is a student at Cornell, uh, and he's designed this one. This one has triple the power, it has a GPS receiver, uh, and a wide variety of other things that you might want if you're doing your own science in space. But you're probably thinking, what could you really do with something this small? I mean, this is not the Hubble Space Telescope, right? You're not gonna put people on here, although maybe, as we heard earlier, their consciousness might be on here someday, but that's a different talk. So what can you do with these things? Well, here's one idea. Let me step back and uh, make the observation that's been made many times. It turns out that transferring data mechanically can be much more efficient than doing so through transmission of data optically or through radio waves or whatever. Take this example, a, uh, a container ship, pack it full of USB drives, send it from the west coast of the US to Asia, and in the process, what you're doing is sending 201,000 terabits per second across the ocean. In comparison, if you were to somehow plug right into the internet and get all of its data capability, you could achieve something like 167 terabits per second, which is a lot of streaming video, right? But it's nothing compared to what you could do with 19th century technology. So weirdly, it's still true that this old approach that we have been taking for hundreds, maybe thousands of years of shipping things across the water, turns out that's still faster in terms of overall data rate than sending something via the internet. I think you can see where I'm going with this. What if we put an SD card on a chip satellite? Okay, so these SD cards can write at something like 250 megabytes per second. Compare that to the transmission rate of the Hubble Space Telescope, an awesome telescope, don't get me wrong but it's capable of only about 0.03 megabytes per second. So there's a factor of 1,000, 10,000 improvement possible for these little tiny spacecraft over Hubble. That's an opportunity in many different ways. The idea might be something like this. You program your chipset, plug it into your computer. That's how they work. You can look it up online, find the kit for it. Plug it into your computer to program it. Uh, we send them to space. They deploy from a CubeSat. They make their observations, maybe of heliophysics or earth science or planetary science, astronomy, whatever science is of interest, and there's a lot of things you could do. Re-enter that chipset, and then, because it has a GPS receiver and can transmit its position, you go pick it up. You download the data into your phone or whatever, and now you've got data from space. And you've done so at a rate that's about a thousand times as fast as a typical satellite. This talk is called How to Build Your Own Spacecraft. And it's honestly less about the building part. It's actually more about why we might want to do such a thing. It's the step toward becoming a spacefaring species. The paradigm shift I'm describing here is one in which we take ownership of this idea rather than looking at let's say the Mars Science Lab, the Curiosity rover, as this impossibly Byzantine, complicated thing that fights against its environment and which we have no real opportunity ever to contribute to. It's a niche project for very specialized people. Rather than looking at space like that, I contend it's within reach of all of us. This is a picture of the spacecraft called the Cislunar Explorer. It's a CubeSat-sized spacecraft that Kyle Doyle, yes, another student at Cornell, uh, has designed. He's invented a water propulsion system. You take sunlight and water, put them together, you get rocket fuel. So this is a water-powered rocket. Uh, if it's successful, it'll launch in 2020, which is not as far as away as, uh, as you might think. It'll launch in 2020 and demonstrate that water alone is sufficient to propel a spacecraft around the moon. In a future, where we are more comfortable with the idea that our creativity, our passion for building things, can in fact take place in space. When we're comfortable with that idea, the spacecraft that we build will look a lot different from how they look now. They won't look like that Curiosity rover anymore. They'll be sustainable. They'll live off the land the way that we should be and often are doing here. Using water and sunlight, that's a sustainable process, right? Those resources are plentiful in space. It turns out there's water all over the solar system. 
You might not realize it. You might think of the moon and Mars and asteroids as dry, dead rocks, but there's plenty of water. So you could refuel this spacecraft. And unlike almost any other spacecraft that's ever been designed, you don't stop when you're out of fuel. This spacecraft can keep on going. So the, the paradigm shift that happens when we start thinking about being creative in space, not just fighting against it, but embracing the environment, making what we are fundamentally good at as humans, being creative and building, when we make that part of how we do space, it changes the conversation. It changes what's possible. So I started off saying that building spacecraft is somehow not normal. I need to reframe that and say that actually I think it's perfectly natural. Thank you.